very much uh, for inviting me to uh, join you tonight on the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil First Nations. It is really a privilege to be here uh, and also to be part of the uh, Low Heat Awards tonight when I know three of the four recipients very well, in fact, uh, certainly one of them who I'll talk about later. But uh, at the outset, I wouldn't mind if everyone would please put their hands together for four outstanding Canadians, Andrew, Sue, Murad, and Sophie, and uh, for all of their contributions at this point in time. Now, they, they'll all, of course, be recognized later in greater detail, but it is truly an inspiring evening to have a, a room full of people to celebrate public policy, to celebrate the contributions of these individuals to thought in Canada, uh, certainly three, particularly to British Columbia, but also to our economy and the well-being of communities right across uh, Western Canada, I'll say, for Murad. Uh, all the way to Saskatchewan, the home of uh, many things, uh, most of which that I remember is Tommy Douglas and, and I'm grateful for that. So for Murad, thank you very much for being here this evening. Uh, I was a public uh, employee. I, wouldn't, I wasn't gonna say uh, public servant because uh, people who work for government are not servants, they're workers and they are diligent and they're committed. And I enjoyed every minute of my time working for government. I had an opportunity to work for ministers, had an opportunity to work for premiers, and then regrettably because of my proximity to, pre uh, to ministers, some of them in this room this evening, uh, on a fateful day in 2001, the Lieutenant Governor phoned me and advised me that my services were no longer required. And uh, so after uh, a number of years in the private sector, uh, trying to find meaning and purpose, uh, it seemed to me that the only way I was going to get back into public policy was through the elected routes. And so I put my name on a ballot and I was the NDP guy in my, my neighborhood, which had voted NDP for a long, 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 long time, except for that awkward interregnum between 2001 and 2005. But it was a, a step into public life, which I assumed would also allow me to maintain my anonymity and allow me to deep, probe deeply into public policy. Regrettably, uh, for 12 interminable years, I was a member of the official opposition, and although Her Majesty paid me every fortnight to be miserable, it was not good for my soul, and I don't think I really contributed a great deal to public policy during that period. But of course, uh, the official opposition is vital and integral to our government, and I keep telling that to the Liberals now and hoping that they'll enjoy it for a decade or so, as I did. <laughs> but. Um, but it was uh, a transition from uh, big ideas and, and being in rooms with, uh, with ministers, with uh, deputy ministers, with policy analysts, and talking and discussing the challenges of our time. And my first job in public life was opening the mail on Parliament Hill. And, um, and I went from there to standing before you as the Premier of British Columbia. So uh, I, I know Richard Zussman tried to capture some of that, but you can well imagine that's a good distance between dear constituent, thank you for your letter, We'll get back to you soon. And this was before the advent of the fax machine. Anyone remember the fax machine? <laughs> I, I have millennials all around me now, and when I use words like that, they cock their head a little bit and say, well, at least he wears Doc Martens. He can't be that bad. But, um, uh, but the, the fax machine was, a, was transformative for British Columbia politicians working in Ottawa because you no longer had the two or three weeks to wait for Canada Post to bring the missive from the West Coast and then a couple of weeks to give it a reasoned response, and then a couple of weeks to get it back. The, the, the fax machine uh, made politics present and contemporary and right in your face. And, and of course now I don't even want to think about Twitter and Instagram and, and emails because I don't ever get to do any of that anymore because I'm the Premier of British Columbia and I have people to do that. <laughs> And I, I'm able instead to focus on public policy. And so what I wanted to do tonight for uh, just a few moments is talk to you about some of the things that we've been doing over the past 14 months. Um, it has been a whirlwind for many. Those of you who are from BC will know that we've been very activist and we've had some extraordinary successes and a couple of bumps along the way. But on balance, we've tried to focus on ensuring that we're making good decisions. My, uh, my deputy minister's here, Don Wright, who is, uh, right in front of me, keeping track. He's not wearing a tie, his socks are nice. <laughs> Martini glasses, it looks like, Ed, so no dogwoods for him. But uh, Don and I, uh, when we uh, came to government and during the transition, we made a couple of commitments to each other, that we were going to ensure that the public service was comfortable with the transition and that they were awakened to the possibilities of their ideas that may have been stifled over the longer period 
of the previous government, and I don't mean any partisan statement by that, all governments have a shelf life, just like that mayonnaise in the back of your fridge, every now and again you have to move it along. And I know with absolute certainty that my shelf life will soon expire. When that is, I do not know, but it will happen, and that is a good thing for public discourse, um, it's a good thing for government, and it's a good thing for the public service. So Don and I set out at the beginning to ensure that those who were already in government were comfortable that their ideas were not just welcomed but encouraged, and also that we wanted to bring new people, younger people, into the public service to have the notion that working on difficult issues, some of the issues that Ed outlined uh, in his remarks, were not only good for you and your community, but they were good for uh, the body politic. And so we've tried to focus on a couple of things. And I, I want to, um, and they're challenges. Uh, and you know, we do the normal things. We, we table budgets. We've uh, balanced a couple uh, in our time. British Columbia is benefiting from uh, extraordinary economic growth. We are well placed uh, on the Asia to look across at the Asia Pacific at, at emerging markets. Uh, most days up until recently, we had a positive working relationship with the United States. Uh, I have a very good working relationship with uh, the governor of Washington and Oregon and California and what's called the Pacific Coast Collaborative. And those th uh, three states and British Columbia make up what a, would be the fifth largest economy in the world if it was separated from our two countries. So this is an important part of the world and things are going very, very well here. And that is not a result necessarily of government policy. Instead, it's a result of the innovators that come to British Columbia, the risk takers, and the creativity of our people and the strength of our uh, institutions. And one of the things that we focused on, of course, is education. For me, public education is the great equalizer in our society. And as we grapple with inequality in our communities, in our cities, in our country, I believe the best way to address that is also obviously through public policy and we're working, we will be the last province to have a legislated poverty reduction plan when it's tabled later this fall. But in, more important than all of that is making sure that individuals have access to knowledge, have access to skills training so they can unlock their full potential, not just for themselves but for their families, their communities and for the province. So when we look at policy deliberations within our government, we ask three basic questions. Are the wages being paid for the jobs being created sufficient to maintain a robust middle class? Are there benefits to the economy broadly from investments that are coming forward? And are we ensuring that we are addressing the challenge of our time? Ed talked about it. Uh, my children also talked to me about it. Climate change and desperate action needed to address that. British Columbia has been a leader for the past decade. Carbon pricing is old hat to us. We don't have to use the notwithstanding clause, although they haven't done that yet, but they might. Uh, they are at court, uh, both Saskatchewan and Ontario, fighting the advent of a national plan uh, to price carbon. British Columbia is well ahead of the curve there. Uh, we were to $30 a ton uh, by 2012, and when we formed government, we moved to $35 a ton, and next year we'll go to 40 the federal mandate, uh, I think we're the only ones now subscribing to it, is $50 a ton, but we're going to continue doing that because we've been able to demonstrate in British Columbia, although it is a, an irritant to business, we continue to have uh, strong economic growth, we're continuing to create jobs, and industry has discounted the carbon price and they're recognizing that in British Columbia it's part and parcel of doing business, and we're also working with uh, uh, energy intensive trade exposed industries to ensure that we're not putting in a competitive disadvantage. And in British Columbia, where we depend on mining, forestry, natural gas, agriculture, and fishing, it's important that those natural resource industries uh, are, are given every opportunity to compete fairly with other jurisdictions that don't have the same level of uh, labor standards, the same level of environmental standards, and in our case, a carbon price. But for us, it's important that we look at all of those issues when we're making uh, decisions. And I come back to education because for me, uh, investing in our children, investing in uh, job creation through skills development is critically important. And when you're at four and a half, and I saw Jock Finlayson here earlier on, when you're at four and a half percent unemployment, you're at virtually zero unemployment. And the challenge for investors, the challenge for companies in British Columbia is to find skilled workers and to keep them. And when you have a housing crisis that puts a home out of the range of most people, when you have challenges around daycare for families who want to make sure that their children are cared for while they're entering back into the workforce after, after birth and as their children start to grow, those are issues that CEOs and companies were talking to me about when I was in that difficult, terrible time of opposition. And they said, what would be really cool 
is if we could attract people to work here so that we could expand our businesses because our markets are demanding more from us and we don't have the people to deliver that. So one of the challenges that we faced is making sure that we added, and Andrew wants me to say this in every speech I make, 2,900 new spaces in universities across British Columbia, the first significant investment in a decade. There you go, Andrew. I'm done on that one. I can move on now. But investing in, in science, technology, engineering, and math is critical to the new economy. It's critical to us going forward. We talk about our traditional industries all the time, but we also have quantum computing. We have film. We have digital. We have animation. We have tourism. We have a whole host of other sectors that are exploding uh, and trying to keep pace with uh, a tourism market, for example, Canada, China, year of tourism this year, and we are the first uh, port of call when you're coming across the Pacific. And when I was in China, I was told that there was an enormous number of people from China who had come to British Columbia. Almost a million people came last year, and I thought, that's fantastic, until I was told that over uh, 250 million Chinese have been moving around the world. So we're not really cornering the market there, but we're going to be working on it. And I see the Deputy Minister of Agriculture and Food is here as well. And the opportunities for agriculture and food from British Columbia, in fact, from Canada to Asia Pacific is, pr is profound. And our federal ports assist us in that regard. But again, going back to education, how do we make sure that we're getting the right people, the right skills for the right jobs? It's always a challenge. And this is where uh, having a whole bunch of smart people in a room grappling with these issues will often come to a better outcome. And for example, we have uh, the opportunity of a liquefied natural gas facility, final investment decision by uh, LNG Canada in the weeks ahead. And they are going to require tens of thousands of people to construct, uh, uh, well, to uh, fabricate, construct, and operate LNG in Northern British Columbia should they come to that final investment decision. It will be uh, in the range of $40 billion of private sector investment in British Columbia, which will have spin-off effects and benefits for provinces right across the country, Saskatchewan uh, with respect to pipe uh, and Alberta with respect to exporting their natural gas as well. So it is a national project in my opinion and uh, I know I, I wasn't supposed to be controversial. There's another national project that I often hear about uh, that uh, it seems to have fallen on, the, on, on bad times and, and I, I'll have to tell you a, a brief anecdote because I, I'm able to do that although I am the, the only thing separating you from your dinner. Uh, and it was uh, in Ottawa, my first visit to see the Prime Minister, there was a glass with water in it uh, on a, a cantilevered ledge right beside my podium. And the Prime Minister and I came down to do a press conference after our first meeting and there was a bank of cameras, the likes of which I had never seen here in British Columbia with the shrinking, uh, and Ed would know this, a shrinking public press. Uh, the media is getting smaller and smaller and more concentrated and more concentrated. Uh, but in Ottawa, they seem to proliferate, which is a good thing. Uh, but there were more cameras than I'd ever seen, and, and the Prime Minister and I had agreed that we were going to talk about softwood lumber, which was my primary reason for being there. We were going to talk about housing, we were going to talk about childcare and transportation initiatives here in BC. And we weren't going to talk about that thing that I'm not going to talk about tonight. But um, <laughs> about five questions in, someone finally said, so what are we going to talk about the pipeline? And I had my hand in my pocket, and I took my hand out, and I hit the glass and it started to fall. Now, this is my first trip outside of British Columbia as leader of the government. And I'm Irish, so I'm hopeful always that luck will be on my side. And I watched this cup spin and spin and spin for what seemed like an eternity, not quite as long as the time I spent in opposition, but very, very close. <laughs> and it kept going down and down. And you'll know that the floors are marble at the House of Commons, just outside uh, the chamber. And the glass hit the ground, and it didn't break. So for that very glimmer of hope that the Irish always have, oh good, things are going to get better. And it started spinning around. And the water was going everywhere. And I looked down and I looked over at the Prime Minister and I said, see, spills can happen anywhere. <laughs> and, and that was the exact response from the media. And so I thought, oh good, I'm off the hook. And I thought, I'll just sit back and I'll let him handle it. And, and the Prime Minister immediately turned and said, we'll get someone to clean that up. And I said, well, of course you will. It's a federal responsibility. <laughs> And, I, and then I said, thank you very much, and I got on a plane to Washington and started talking about softwood lumber. But uh, it, these are vexing challenges for our country and, and for the people uh, who are looking for uh, family-supporting jobs and a way forward for their communities. And I, I fully understand that. And I have done my level best 
to uh, manage the responsibilities I have within my order of government, and that is to protect and defend the things that are important to British Columbians. And I, I firmly believe that our cooperative federalism works best when the tensions that certainly the, uh, Peter Lougheed would have known so, so well in his time from going from blue to purple to red, uh, that we have to find ways forward. And public policy discussions and debates and arguments are how we do that. And it, I think it's the quintessential Canadian approach to government and to how do we integrate uh, our free market economy that does so very, very well in, uh, in, in Canada with uh, public investments that make Canada better. Child care investments that we're making today are often considered social policy statements, but in fact they are economic statements. We are investing in people when we do that. Uh, infrastructure, again, often thought of as moving people, not just goods and services, but people as well. Those investments make our economy go, and making the right choices on multi-billion dollar investments is critically important, and that's the role of public policy. Is this the best place to put a subway line? Will we be able to shape density around that subway line? What is gonna be the response of citizens in that area who prefer to keep the, uh, the neighborhood that they grew up in? All of those issues require debate, discussion, and sometimes confrontation. But those who do enter into the fray uh, often do it because they believe the best outcome, the good society that we want for all of us, involves give and take. And to be uh, in a government that came uh, just the way I wrote it up on the whiteboard, Ed, I, I said, okay, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna sneak up on them, we're gonna come very, very close, and then we're gonna uh, make an arrangement with a, with a minority party and have good government for the next 16 years. And I'm fairly confident <laughs> that it's gonna work just like that because that's how we wrote it up. But. Um, but it doesn't always come out the way you want it. And many people have said to me, well, you must be disappointed that you weren't able to achieve a majority government. And, and quite honestly, and, and people say, yeah, sure, Horgan, you're just making that up. Quite honestly, I have to work harder and better and smarter in the environment that I'm in right now. I have to listen to people. And, and that's something that, by, by the good fortune of the jobs that I've had in my life, um, working in, in the House of Commons, working in government and in elected life and now as Premier, I've been able to watch the good and the bad. I've been able to learn from those who came before me. And I want to, with that, introduce uh, one of the speakers, or one of the award winners tonight, because I consider him to be one of the best. Andrew Petter was our utility fielder in the 1990s. He could play all positions, he could bat, he could steal bases, uh, and he could talk and talk and talk. And he was, always, <laughs> he was also very interesting. The Minister of Advanced Education, Aboriginal Affairs, as it was called at that time, forests, finance, and of course the job that he was made for, Attorney General of British Columbia. And during that time, Andrew was uh, respected by his opponents, certainly respected by his colleagues, and there was never fear with Andrew, which is sometimes a tool that politicians use. And with Andrew, it was always uh, the bonhomie, he was hail fellow, well met, he understood people, he understood the importance of discourse, and he was always prepared to have a dialogue and a debate. And I believe that's the essence of public policy, and that's the essence of Andrew Petter. Uh, he was uh, the youngest, the youngest executive assistant in the government of Dave Barrett, uh, which says a lot because that was a million years ago. <laughs> and, uh, and I think Andrew's hair was gray then. Uh, I'm not sure. But there's a story going around, and Andrew denies that he says it's not true at all, but I maintain that it has to be true because it's hilarious. And it involves... <laughs> It involves a guy named Bob Williams, and for anyone who's from British Columbia, you will know that Bob was the intellectual giant of the NDP. Uh, he'll tell you that uh, even to this day in his 80s. <laughs> and uh, where's MacArthur? He's got to be laughing at that. There he, go, he is, too, shaking in his chair. Um, uh, but Bob was brilliant, and he was the, uh, the minister of almost everything in the Barrett government. And uh, there was another fellow uh, named uh, Alec McDonald, who was the... Uh, the, uh, the legal mind that kept uh, Dave out of jail and Bob on the straight and narrow. And the two of them were walking along the concourse in Victoria on their way for a drink, and Andrew was walking by, and they said, let's get the young fellow to come along. Uh, knowing that he had left his wallet behind, they said, oh, don't worry about it, we'll vouch for you. And, uh, of course, the drinking age was 21 at that time, and Andrew, I think, was just 21, but he looked 14. <laughs> and uh, so the story goes that Bob and, and Alex said, don't worry about it, uh, Andrew, we'll vouch for you. Everyone knows who we are at the Bengal Room in the storied uh, Empress Hotel in Victoria. 
So uh, they all went in and sat down for the drink, and the waiter came over and said, oh, Mr. Mr. Williams, good to see you, Mr. McDonald, and, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm going to have to ask you for ID. And, and Andrew goes, oh, I don't have any ID, but, and at that moment, Alex said, I've never seen this lad before in my life. He shouldn't be in here. <laughs> And so a Andrew was thrown out. Now, he maintains up and down this is not true, and he's frowning at me now. <laughs> but, uh, but it does speak to, uh, to his time uh, uh, developing public policy, going from uh, a minister of the crown to a, a dean of law to a president of a university, uh, one of the greatest guys I've known and uh, just a wonderful human being. Andrew Petter, congratulations on being one of this year's award winners in the Lowheath, Peter Lougheed Award of Public Policy.